In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The scripture readings offered at this service this evening, the Easter Vigil, attempt to present very briefly and in a cursory way the overview of the growth of God's people in understanding their faith and its development through the centuries until its great culmination, its sign and seal in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God and his continuing life with us. So this evening we began where it all begins with the creation of the world which God in his love fashions in order that men and women and all creation could have a loving relationship with God, with one another and everything that is. And then we heard how when things went awry by human choice, God showed that he wished freedom and respect for all people as he freed the Israelites from slavery. The story of Ezekiel, the prophet of weird visions, including the valley of dry bones and God calling them forth again to new life, tells us that God brings life and hope and new beginnings in hopeless situations. And finally, the culmination of it all, the point to which it has all been leading, is the event we are here to celebrate tonight the resurrection of Jesus after he was murdered on the cross. And this is the sign and seal of the integrity of God and the guarantee of the truth of God's presence in every situation. Of the three Hebrew Bible stories we've heard this evening, I have a particular resonance in the story of Ezekiel. Ezekiel became a prophet, the voice of God, to the exiles. During the time of exile, Ezekiel assured his hearers of the abiding presence of God among them. He emphasized constantly the Lord's role in the events of the day so that Israel and the nations, to to quote, will know that I, God, am the Lord a refrain that occurs many times throughout Ezekiel. So in the vision of the dry bones made well known in the famous African-American spiritual, Ezekiel describes himself caught up by God in his vision and transported to a valley that was strewn with the bones of countless people long dead and asked by God whether this tangled jumble of bleached bones would ever live again, Ezekiel really doesn't have an answer. But God commands him to prophesy breath and life for these bones. Ezekiel hesitantly obeys, and to his astonishment, the bones begin to order themselves once again as bodies. And these bodies again, receive breath when God commands Ezekiel to prophesy that. They receive breath and life, and that exceeding great host then takes to its feet. And Ezekiel then goes on to explain that the dry bones represent the house of Israel, cut off from the temple and their homeland without hope. These exiles are as dead and buried, scattered without community. And in the power of the Spirit, however, God opens their graves and restores them to life. What Ezekiel promises, therefore, is that God will give proof of his lordship by returning Israel to its land and reconstituting it as a nation as they sit by the waters of Babylon, not able to sing their songs or worship their God in a foreign land to which they have been dragged. 
The vision proclaims trust, trust in the power of God to fill a people despite utterly hopeless circumstances, to fill a people with that renewed life which only God can give. It's rather a macabre story, but as I said, it's held a significance for me for at least 45 years. I was a young man of 25, yikes, 25, and I had just arrived on my first visit to Rome after attending some church meetings in Africa. And it was a cold, raw January in the Eternal City, and I was staying in a little pension on the Via Veneto, and I wanted to visit the little church of Our Lady of the Conception just down the street, or, or more particularly, I wanted to visit the Capuchin crypt in its basement. The Capuchin friars, uh, an order of Franciscans, whose church it was, had buried their dead there for more than 500 years. I say buried, they, they really buried each one for about 30 years until the flesh melted off them, and then to make more room, they were dug up, and they used the bones to decorate the place. Arches, piles of bones, and columns built, and sculptures made of the separated, scattered bones of well more than 4,000 friars over the years. Bones. Dry bones indeed. It, it was a macabre memento mori to remind us of all the transitory nature of life. There was even a sign in three languages in the little chapel, the little crypt, reminding visitors, as you are, so we were, as we are so you will be. And I always imagine it read in the voice of Boris Karloff or, or Vincent Price. It was stunning and fascinating and thought-provoking, and I spent a lot of time there thinking about life and death and all the rest of it. And you know, I still exactly remember the date I went to this monument to the brief nature of light. It was Epiphany. It was January the 6th in 1976. And I remember the date so clearly because when I arrived back at the pension, still thinking of what I had experienced in my time there in my meditation, I had a phone call from my brother in Canada telling me that my mother had just died and that I should come home. Ezekiel's vision has come to have some meaning to me as I, for whatever reason, link those things together. Although his vision is strange and couched in symbols and language foreign to us some 2,600 years later, it still holds a true picture of the human condition and the way in which God works with us. Each of us, you and I, stand among the clutter of broken dreams and lost hopes of disobedience and shattered relationships of powerlessness in the face of forces beyond our control. The ashes of Wednesday coat our mouths and choke us. All can seem barren, dry, without beauty or meaning or hope. The bones among which we each stand may be very different. For some it may be illness, for some of us it may even be the sickness of approaching death, the present or future loss of a loved one, the loneliness of old age as our bodies slowly begin to show they are beyond our command. 
the pressure of being caught between aging parents and the needs of grown children. Worry over spouses, children, loneliness, the lack of human community and love, the, the diminishment of the church. Perhaps life itself has lost its meaning, becoming as dry and tasteless as whitened bones. And maybe you dwell among the dry bones of loss of faith, of doubt in a God of love. Questions of meaning and feelings of guilt or worthlessness or rejection by God, if God is even real. Dead, dry bones. Or maybe, maybe even the fear of bones. It's hard for us to stand in that place and trust in God. It's, it's difficult to believe and act in the faith that God can and will bring life and hope in the middle of all this stuff we slog through so much of our lives. It's hard to move toward faith, trusting God's promise that he will bring resurrection in the midst of all the things that shout death. Yet Ezekiel tells us that is God's promise. And the resurrection of Jesus is the seal on the truth of that promise. When we act in faith, not great heroic gestures, but simply in the small, almost unnoticed ways we are able. When we trust, when we love, slowly and slowly but surely the, the miracle begins. Love and hope push up, push up through the bones. And the tomb opens and we begin to recognize little resurrections, echoing the great resur resurrection in our lives. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary trudged through their field of dried bones early that first Easter Sunday morning as they went to weep over Jesus' dead body. Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was to bring peace and justice, new hope, redemption, their friend was now dead. And they carried within themselves a wreck of hope. They had thought they could trust in Jesus and then came Friday. Of all the disappointments of a life lived in disappointment, this is one of the most shattering, to, to feel that God himself can't be counted on. Much of the skepticism in our world has its root in cynicism. We, we simply fear that even God, if God exists, cannot be trusted. We're afraid to believe. We suspect we will all be disappointed in the end. Each of us has that inner voice that begs an answer to the questions, but so often our best hope seems to end up dead on a cross and we feel fooled or tricked again. One way maybe to discover God's trustworthiness is to learn to open our eyes to Christ's continued resurrected presence in our midst, to recognize as a member of this community that God is moving among us, even here at St. George's, believe it or not. Again and again, God whispers, I'm here. Open your eyes and you will see. Help one another, help one another to learn to see. The scriptures, the the story of the two Marys testifies to that, but the only convincing proof of the reality of the presence of Christ is when we meet him ourselves in the company of each other. There was an empty tomb, but only a personal encounter later with the risen Christ in the community of Christ made that empty tomb a reality in their lives, gave it meaning, turned it into a fact. That's what gives us proof of the 
trustworthiness of God. And so our, our eyes opened, our, our eyes opened to see him. Can, can you see him in the lives of the people in this room? Lives that have been profoundly affected by his presence and power if we only knew each other's story. Can you hear his voice in the preaching, in the music, in our prayers? Can, can you touch him? Can you take him in, in the bread and wine we will share? The living Christ is in truth speaking to your heart. So then the cross did not appear as the tragic end, but as a new beginning, it's true meaning slowly became clear in the community of faith. And God has demonstrated once and for all that God can be trusted, that no matter how dark, how bleak, how impossible you feel your situation to be, God is there, visible or invisible, opening new avenues. That's what resurrection is about. God in Christ has conquered death and failure and fear and betrayal forever. Therefore, God is with us in our present. He's risen. He's here with us in this room right now. Because Christianity is about resurrection or it's about very little. It's about life out of death, about new beginnings and second chances, about water from the rock. It's recognizing Christ through our heartbreaking sobs. Resurrection is about learning, like Mary Magdalene, to hear God call you by your own private and secret name through your tears. But Jesus' resurrection tells us that God won't let you down. The scriptures tell us Jesus won't. The community will tell us this as they hold us up. For Jesus is with us always. No one who puts their trust in that truth will be disappointed. And together we can learn that, tr that trust and give thanks. So really we all experienced little resurrection shadows of the great resurrection we celebrate tonight. Our, our, our dead bones can be raised to life. The facts of the situation in which we find ourselves may not necessarily change, but that's not the promise. We are promised that in the midst of our situation, miracles are still happening if we help one another to see and to recognize them. That's why we get together. We can support one another as we slowly move from sorrow to hope, from doubt to faith, because Jesus lives. Making a decision to live the gospel together as well as we are able can be the beginning. Community can arise. Love can grow as we care for each other, as we care for all God's world. Like Ezekiel, like the two Marys, like all the disciples, like all those who have gone before us upon whose shoulders we stand, we too can know that God is faithful. The one whom we have learned to trust can still be trusted in the middle of all the questions. The, the tomb opens, the bones rise and dance in joy. The valley of bones becomes the valley of life. And the living Jesus, whom we learn to know, will still be seen in the midst of us all. And that's worth celebrating. Amen. <laughs>